thank you very much, um, Dr. Dwight McKee, for this pleasure and honor to, to be able to speak with you today for Vitalstoff blog, the uh, audience, readers and listeners um, of this blog know that this is a site where people can access information on all aspects of integral health and uh, prevention. So we are very, very happy to be able to have you on the show today. And if you allow, I will just give a brief introduction on how this came about. Sure. Uh, it was back in 2007 uh, when I heard you speak. Uh, and it was not so much it was uh, what you said, um, what you said was, was very, very important, but also the references you made, because um, to my background, I, my readers know, um, some of them know, I have been a trained historian, and um, as a historian, you, you learn how to trace back um, the source. And uh, so whenever I, I hear people making references, I have a habit of looking up the source. And one of those references you made was Bruce uh, Ames. And this uh, really provided a huge um, boost in, in um, uh, as well in curiosity as, as in confidence um, on, on all health, um, health issues. And from then on, I have continu continued to, to read and uh, later also to start to write about and publish about um, what I make of um, the health issues because I believe um, that it is something which we all should um, learn as much about as, as possible. Now, Clyde, you um, are uh, a, um, a doctor, um, uh, a licensed, phys licensed physician. You have um, uh, several degrees of, of, of licenses in, in, in the medical field. But I would like to start with this uh, quote, um, which you mentioned uh, when I heard you speak. And, and you said, I have been and continue to be interested in every factor that can have a bearing in our health. So maybe this is a good starting point for you to give us some background on, on how you, how this came about. How did your interest, interest grow and, and what have you been up to so far? Yes, thank you, Ova. Um, and it's really a pleasure for me to, to be here with you. I've known you for a long time and I've seen your work uh, interviewing other uh, colleagues of mine and um, I was very impressed with the, uh, the quality, the thoughtfulness, uh, the detail that you bring uh, to your interview. So I was really um, very happy when you uh, suggested this interview. I began my, uh, my medical career in integrative uh, health, integrative medicine. That word, excuse me, that word had not been um, coined yet. I believe Andrew Weil was the one who coined it. So I started practicing in 1976 uh, after doing the minimum amount of, of postgraduate education, one year of internship. And I was at that point already extremely interested in herbal medicine, in nutrition, in uh, energy medicine, mind-body mind medicine. And um, I developed early on an interest in cancer, which I approached initially from an integrative slash alternative side. The experience that I'd had during my training from 1970 to 75 with cancer had not been very um, uh, impressive. I, I, you know, I saw much more failure, a lot of toxicity, um, very little in the way of healing. It was the early days of uh, platinum. It didn't have good uh, anti-emetic agents, so patients were just losing weight and throwing up, and uh, it was it was really a very a very bad scene. And so I was really motivated at that time to go in the other direction. And I explored all the alternative therapies that had been developed 
that were being utilized uh, at that time in the late 1970s. And I had more and more people with cancer coming to me in my practice. So I was, you know, going to, in those days, there was no internet. And um, I went to the meetings of the American Holistic Medical Association, which was a new, um, a new association started by Norm Sheely. Um, I was a founding member of it. And I went to many of the talks by people who ultimately developed what we now call functional medicine. So I kind of grew up with functional and integrated medicine. And after about 12 years of, of practice, working with cancer patients, I reached a point where I was able to help about 20%, significantly help about 20% of people with stage four cancer. These were all people who'd either had conventional treatment or been told that there was really no treatment for them or that you know, palliative care was, was their only option. So that's what I started with, and, and that's pretty much been the, the group that I've um, worked with over my career, the, the most difficult um, cancer patients. Then I reached a point where I could help about 20% of them, and that's 20% more than were being helped in, um, in conventional oncology, but I wasn't satisfied with it, and I was kind of frustrated also, there was an issue at that time. So this was from 76 to 88. Many of my patients would be getting better, feeling better, gaining weight, getting stronger, um, having less pain. And many of them were still being followed by an oncologist. And they would go see their oncologist and tell them, you know, all these things they're doing and how much better they're feeling. And, and it was pretty routine that the oncologist would respond by, you know, sticking a pin in their balloon, basically, and saying, well, you know, that may be, but, you know, you have incurable cancer and, you know, it's unlikely that you'll live more than six months. And so I would build up this, this, um, hope and, um, and actual improvement in their function. And then it would all be, be let out. So I decided that I needed to become an oncologist mm -hmm. if I was going to take this any further. And I also had the sort of intuitive feeling that the... the wise use, the careful use of conventional oncology combined with integrative care could be more powerful than either one alone. And, um, and that proved to be true. And now there is a field called integrative oncology. There's a society of integrative oncology uh, that I belong to. And there are many different versions of it. Um, all of the major cancer centers uh, in the U.S. have integrative medicine or integrative oncology programs. They are kind of what I call integrative light, um, acupuncture, music, therapy, massage, um, Body mind, um, you know, visualization training. Many times, uh, psycho psychological counseling. Sometimes exercise. Um, sometimes some very sort of basics about diet. But they really don't go. They don't go beyond that into botanical medicine and and uh, nutritional supplements 
and any of the specific dietary interventions such as, as ketogenic diet, which is useful in certain uh, certain aspects. But it's a you know it's a huge shift. So you know what I was doing in the late 1970s at that time was called cancer quackery. And now it's called integrative oncology. So um, you know it, it, it's come a long ways. It has a way to go, but I think the younger oncologists are more open to things like um, supplements and and uh, botanical medicine, as well as acupuncture, energy medicine, body mind medicine, lifestyle, diet. Um, and so forth. So along, you know, that's kind of been the overarching interest uh, over my career has been um, integrative cancer care. If I may, um, Dwight, uh, this, this what you're talking about now, um, sometimes um, is met by criticism uh, in the um, society, in the media especially, um, because people say, and, and sometimes uh, even um, physicians say, it is enough uh, to have uh, a well-balanced diet. Um, what is your opinion on this and what would be the reasons uh, why this may not be enough uh, in our times? Well, I, you know, I think that that was true 80 years ago. Um, since World War II, we've rapidly and significantly industrialized the food supply. There has been a bigger shift in the diet of people in the developed world in the last hundred years than there was 10,000 years ago with the shift from hunter-gathering to agriculture. When people realized that they could plant seeds and they would come up and produce more seeds and the same with roots and tubers. The birth of agriculture um, was a dramatic change in the diet. And uh, the science of uh, anthropology tells us that our ancestors from that time, about 10,000 years ago, paid a price for that, that shift. Um, we see in the, in the skeletal remains that um, people became smaller, weaker, and developed degenerative diseases, arthritic uh, changes that were not present in the you know, 10 generations earlier in the hunter-gatherer societies. What was gained was the ability to create civilization. If you're following the food supply, you don't have a state, you, you know, you're never going to build a town, a city. Um, and I don't think that the people who initially uh, saw that they could put a, some seeds in the soil and plants would come up and give forth with seeds again that could be ground and to, you know, and become a stable food source. I doubt that they realized that they were creating the situation to allow civilization to develop. And I often wonder if there's something analogous going on now with the industrialization of the food supply um, that is laying the, the, the foundation for something as profound as you know, the birth of civilization. Um, I, I don't think it will be possible to know the answer to that for hundreds of years. Yeah. Um, but it's a very profound transition that's taken place. It's taken place relatively rapidly, but also in the terms of a human life, uh, fairly slowly. And we now have a food supply that's abundant. 
that is convenient, that has tremendous uh, shelf life, you know, tremendous storage uh, capacity. And in order to accomplish that, we've added about 3,000 chemicals to the food supply. We've also released about over 100,000 chemicals industrially into the environment. And uh, I, I was recently listening to a lecture by a, a chemist who founded the, uh, was one of the founders of the field of green chemistry. And he made a very, I think a very insightful comment <clears throat> that the reason that our chemical industry and the chemicals used in industry that are routinely discharged into the environment, the reason that they are toxic is because we've never trained our chemists in toxicology. He said, yeah, he said, I have a PhD in chemistry. I never had a single course in toxicology. So the chemists are very good at, you know, they can make any molecule and they can find which molecules will do what functions that are useful industrially. But the toxicology is completely off the radar because they were, they were never trained in. And we haven't put toxicologists and chemists together. <clears throat> and I think that's, that's really needed so that over the next decades, um, at least we can shift to green chemistry so that the compounds that are of utility industrially will not be toxic or easily degrade um, and can be specifically degraded um, so, that, so that we don't have, you know, polychlorinated biphenyls accumulating in the, in the food chain and, you know, all the other toxins. So you mentioned Bruce Ames. Um, he was, his work was one of my aha moments in which he showed that both aging and environmental um, toxicity cause enzymes, which are the very complex proteins with very specific structures that allow the chemistry of life to take place at 37 degrees centigrade rather than hundreds of degrees centigrade as would be required in a chemical laboratory. Enzymes can get toxins stuck to them. And the reason that substances are toxic is largely because they interfere with enzyme function. And vitamins and minerals are coenzymes. They bind to these complex protein molecules in specific ways to bring the, um, the business end of the enzyme into the proper conformation so that it can, whatever it's designed to do, methylate, demethylate, uh, which is you know, just transferring one carbon and three hydrogens um, from one molecule to another, or oxidize or reduce or um, the, the, the incredibly complex uh, biochemistry of life that goes on is requires enzyme function and enzymes require coenzymes, which are vitamins and minerals. And so if we've depleted the soil, the topsoil of magnesium and selenium and zinc and so forth, <clears throat> we don't have enough of those elements to maintain enzyme function as we get older and as we accumulate more toxins from the environment. Ames showed that higher levels of vitamins and minerals, which are coenzymes, which allow enzymes to function properly, can overcome these, uh, these deficits. And so I, I think that the, um, the naysayers that um, think that supplements make expensive urine, essentially, uh, that we don't need these things, that if you eat a balanced diet, which very few people do anyway, um, because the convenience of 
the processed food supply, the low cost, the convenience, the good taste, the entire aim of the processed food industry is to develop inexpensive, good tasting, stable, um, and visually attractive foods. Nutrition is not part of that equation. Nutrients are not part of that equation. I see the, the supplement industry, which has developed over the same time that we've industrialized the food supply, as a natural <clears throat> and probably coming from the collective unconscious of people who intuitively realize that we do have issues with this dramatic shift in the, the nutrient supply. Right. And people who only, <clears throat> you know, the, the, the minority of people who have the resources and the interest and the availability to seek out organic foods, um, they're not the same foods that our grandparents grew up eating. Yeah. A hundred years ago, all food was organic. There wasn't such a thing as non-organic food. Everybody used compost. Everybody, you know, planted crops together to um, guard against pests and so forth. It was, it was industrial agriculture that allowed this massive monoculture. And then things like uh, glyphosate, invented by Monsanto, um, <clears throat> a very simple molecule based on the amino acid glycine, which interferes in the shikimate pathway, will specifically kill all broadleaf plants, which are most of the weeds um, consist of. And then with genetic engineering actually created crops that are um, food crops that are immune to glyphosate. So <clears throat> it's very convenient and works very well from a production um, perspective to have these large fields of one kind of plant, corn or wheat or <clears throat> whatever it is, strawberries, um, with the ability to apply herbicides and pesticides. The chemicals have replaced the farming practices that we've had for 10,000 years, that have been developed for 10,000 years. People learned things to plant together because it would increase resistance, certain things to plant that would repel uh, insect pests and so forth. Um, and that traditional wisdom has all been replaced by, um, by industrial agriculture. <clears throat> so we have industrial agriculture, which has had a tremendous impact on the topsoil, tremendous impact on the planet. <clears throat> we, we now have these, you know, concentrated um, animal uh, facilities uh, raising pigs and cattle and chickens <clears throat> in enormous quantities um, <clears throat> with very, um, <clears throat> both a lot of, of toxic waste. Antibiotics are pretty much required in that setting to prevent um, you know, diseases running through such large uh, congregations of animals. It was also discovered that antibiotics will speed the growth of animals. <clears throat> so even, <clears throat> even people who are conscious and aware and eat very well, you know, we still eat in restaurants. We still consume things with glyphosate. Every time I've eaten a corn chip in a, in a Mex with salsa in a Mexican restaurant, I've gotten GMO corn. Um, that has genes in it that can recombine with the bacteria in my gut and make the, um, the toxin that uh, was designed to kill the, the corn weevil. 
the problem when 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 glyphosate was developed initially called roundup um the scientists were very excited because they said well this doesn't interfere with mammalian cells we don't have a shikimate pathway in our mammalian cells and that was true <clears throat> but at that time nobody realized the profound and central role of the microbiome in the body and the microbiome depends entirely on the shikimate pathway it's all bacteria <clears throat> so the the glyphosate uh, residue, and you can find glyphosate in the urine of virtually every human on this planet at this point in time, in some concentration. <clears throat> it's, it's interfering with the microbiome of the soil, and it's interfering with our micro, the microbiome in our gut profoundly. It's like eating an antibiotic every day. Right. It's essentially an antibiotic. Right. It is also, as you said, um, uh, a synthetic amino acid, or it is derived from um, glycine analogs. Mm -hmm. and, and Dr. Stephanie Seneff, uh, who teaches um, at MIT, who has a degree in, um, in biology, so she is, although she, uh, her, her main work has been in the computer uh, IT field, she is um, uh, knowledgeable of, uh, of mm -hmm. biologic issues and she has been arguing that uh, the interference of glyphosate is far beyond just the uh, disruption of the shikimate pathway um, which we don't have but we will uh, also we, all of us will build um, uh, our, our proteins um, which which uh, which take up glycine which need glycine if this should they, be replaced they, they talk, by toxic analog yeah yeah yeah, and that, that's her theory. And this has never been this has never been assessed. So the risk assessment uh, for glyphosate has been very, 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 very limited. Uh, and everyone is being told that this is a safe um, um, chemical. And, and this is um, very, very well. Safe. Only, only looking at the profound central role of the microbiome in our health, it runs forty percent of our immune system. Right. 40% of the small interfering RNA that circulates in our blood, which is one of the major mediators of epigenetics, um, comes from our microbiome. And we know that glyphosate is tremendously toxic to our microbiome, as well as the microbiome of the soil. It kills the nematodes in the soil. <clears throat> so we have an increasingly sterile um, soil, which should be vibrant and teeming with bacteria and nematodes and uh, you know all of these things. So I, I mean, I really see the food supplement industry and it's, it's the opposite. <clears throat> so it's complementary. It's the perfect complement to the industrialized food supply because it is um, full of bad tasting things uh, like polyphenols, which are extremely bitter concentrates removed from from food sources like uh, grape seeds and and pine bark uh, that are particularly rich in these polyphenols and many other concentrates from the specific plants that we call herbs we call them herbs because they're plants that have not only nutritive value but restorative value um, healing value. That's why there's a specific class of plants that we call herbs, um, because they have uh, the ability to heal. 60% of our modern pharmaceuticals were derived from plants. And plant, the plant kingdom is, the, they, plants and fungi are the master chemists of the planet. And they're what we need to look to as our model for green chemistry. They've got it down. So the food supplement is, industry is also creating a stable shelf life, <clears throat> putting things into tablets that are coated with a um, resin that keeps out moisture, keeps out oxygen, prevents, prevents oxidation. So we have a long-term stable supply 
of bad tasting for the most part, um, things that are provided in tablet and, and capsule form to complement, I wouldn't even call it supplement, to complement the industrialized um, diet. And this is very early days. We're, you know, we're feeling our way. Um, people find out things that, that, um, that help, that improve um, specific conditions and so forth. And it's, it's, a, it's a rapidly growing creative area. Uh, unfortunately, you know, there has been, as in all human endeavors, um, there have been uh, people who are profiteering or, and, and you know, making um, expensive placebos that really don't have anything in them. Um, that was quite common in the 70s and the 80s. Now there's more regulation that makes that more difficult. Um, but it still goes on and, and that's often pointed to as well, see this, this, uh, this whole thing is corrupt, but it's, you know, it's probably 10%. Can I, can I um, jump in here and why? Because I think there is also another um, strong criticism. Well, it is voiced in a strong manner. I'm not saying it is strong, but it is something which I would like to address at this point because um, uh, physicians, scientists um, who follow my blog, they are um, somewhat, um, 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 they are acknowledging uh, the, the, uh, the effort which has been put into this, but what they keep saying is, you know, um, there is not much scientific evidence that these things will work. Um, what is your comment um, to this? What is science anyway? I mean, is science truth? <clears throat> there, there is actually a lot of scientific evidence. The problem is that it's in journals that are not read by these kinds of experts. <clears throat> so, I mean, you have to, to dig. Um, a lot of the science is created in uh, universities from Asia, where there's a strong tradition of herbal medicine. And so the scientists were, they were raised in that culture. They have more respect for it. And they're interested in finding out, you know, applying the tools of science to the traditions that are thousands of years old. That may be, but, but there are also um, journals, very um, well-respected journals who have been publishing um, uh, findings about uh, even dangers um, of vitamins. I remember the um, st one study um, in Finland, which which uh, found or uh, which claimed to have found evidence for beta carotene and vitamin E being uh, dangerous. Yeah. So what what what? Well, again, you know, <coughs> some clinical research. Uh, clinical research only gives you information or the information that it provides is limited by the trial design. And many of the doctors who design these clinical studies are not sophisticated in the areas of nutritional biochemistry. The Finnish smoker study is, is, is a perfect example. So they wanted to see because there was evidence that people who had diets higher in beta carotene and higher in vitamin E had a less risk of lung cancer if they smoked. So they thought, well, let's take these, um, these substances out and give them in large doses to, um, to smokers. <clears throat> so, to understand this, you need to know a little bit about um, antioxidant networks or redox. You know, in biochemistry, reduction and oxidation are opposite um, reactions, and there's a lot of shuttling back and forth between us. Yes. It's exchange of electrons, basically. <clears throat> so, in one 
puff of cigarette smoke, there are trillions of free radicals. Free radicals are unstable molecules that have a single electron. Electrons like to be paired, so they will, you know, do a pinball kind of thing, uh, chain reactions to stabilize themselves. And it's the special molecules that we call antioxidants. A better name for them are redox active um, molecules that can ex that can donate or accept an electron and remain stable and not continue this chain reaction. So they end the chain reaction. <clears throat> the problem or the fallacy in the design of the uh, Finnish smokers study was that so you have men who smoke, who also drink alcohol, whose diets are, especially in the winter, have very little fresh food. They kind of eat meat and potatoes. So they have, a, they have a, an antioxidant poor diet. Their diet's low in antioxidants. They're smoking, which is an enormous oxidative stress. And <clears throat> so they're, there are, there are two major antioxidant systems in the body. One, the molecules that the body makes, such as superoxide dismutase, it's an enzyme. Um, human serum albumin, the major protein in the blood, is a very potent um, antioxidant. Uric acid, which um, you know we think of as bad because it causes gout. Uric acid is a very potent antioxidant. So these are things that are made in the body but they're designed to be complemented with antioxidants in the diet. And so these people are not complementing their endogenous antioxidants. Their endogenous antioxidants were never designed to handle an activity like smoking. And then you put in vitamin E, and they use, by the way, synthetics, um, tocopherol, which is a, a handed molecule that can come in a right hand and a left hand. So when you synthesize a molecule chemically like that, you get an equal mixture of right and left-handed molecules. But the body can only use the right-handed molecules. And the left-handed molecules, in some cases, we know interferes. This hasn't been documented with, with uh, tocopherol, but it, it's a possibility. And the beta-carotene was also synthetic. So it had a, a slightly different conformation from natural beta-carotene. A lot of people have seized on that and said, oh, well, it would be different. I don't think it would be different if they'd used natural D-alpha tocopherol and natural beta carotene because they're using two antioxidants in large amounts, putting them into a system that doesn't have, that is deficient in the ingested antioxidant network all of, you know, not just beta carotene, but all of the carotenoids and all of the flavonoids and all of the things that are mainly in plants. And these are people eating a plant poor diet in Finland, um, <clears throat> supplemented with alcohol and cigarettes. And when you put an antioxidant in a large amount into a system that doesn't have a, a robust network of antioxidants, <clears throat> those molecules will actually become long-lived free radicals. So you'll get it to, you have it, this free radicals from the, from this, the smoking, it knocks an uh, electron off of tocopherol and it will persist much longer because of its ability to be an antioxidant but it will do more damage because it doesn't have partners to hand it off. If I had designed this, this the Finnish smoker study, I would have included 20 or 30 antioxidants, not two. Right. <clears throat> and, um, you know, we can't know for sure without doing it, but there's, a, there's also a conflict between the way our science has developed to, <clears throat> 
we, we like clinical trials to change only a few variables. So if I came in and said, oh, I want to use 30 antioxidants, well, they said, well, that doesn't fit scientific design because how would we know what's doing what? And, and that's the problem with all holistic systems. I've learned in cancer that you have to make multiple, many, many interventions all at once. <clears throat> I came up with the, the saying, there is no magic bullet but there is sometimes a magic matrix. Right. And in that matrix, we can't say, well, is this particular thing essential or, or not? But in stage four cancer, we're interested in outcomes. We're interested in getting the best possible outcome. So, you know, I will err on the side of, you know, maybe using some things that are, I try not to use things that are, you know, that are harmful. Um, and there, there can be, like there's a specific fish oil uh, or, or a specific omega-3 fatty acid uh, that's particularly uh, more of it in mackerel and herring, and it's in some commercial fish oils, particularly those that use mackerel and herring, that will, uh, if it's present at, with chemotherapy, it will create resistance in the cells to chemotherapy. Um, a long time ago, I, I, I participated in writing a textbook on interactions between uh, herbs, nutrients, and drugs. About, well, we worked on it from 2002 to 2007 when it was published. And from that experience, I developed the uh, idea of the, the a prudent way to integrate Nutritional, sub, nutritional and botanical supplements with chemotherapy is to stop nutritional supplements the day before, the day of, and the day after chemotherapy. And when, I, when the study came out with the, the um, four double bond, 16 carbon omega-3 fatty acid, if you follow that and you stop the day before, day of, and day after, there's absolutely no problem because it doesn't last more than 70, more than um, actually 24 hours. So yeah, that we, we, we don't yet have, or the science for studying complex holistic interventions is really in its infancy. It's really embryonic. The well-developed system is the, you know, double blind randomized placebo controlled clinical trial which purports to, to just investigate one or two in the Spanish uh, smoker study. Um, I think they also used vitamin C, but they found that the people who got beta carotene or vitamin E had a higher risk of lung cancer. They had more statistically significant, more lung cancer. And that was a very, you know, it really surprised the investigators and it got a lot of press because it was, well, clearly, you know, nutrients are dangerous. But they really didn't understand the context. And the, the, more, the older I get and the more experience I have, the more I realize that so much is context. Yeah. Very little is good and bad. It's the context that makes it good or bad. Yeah. Dr. Dave Bredesen, uh, who I've had um, the pleasure of interviewing um, this program as well. Uh, he's uh, he's um, working on um, the science of uh, of uh, cognitive um, degeneration, and he has been saying the same uh, as you have that the, uh, the classical, conventional, uh, scientific approaches need to be revised and changed because the complexity of the problems we are dealing with and also with uh, Alzheimer's disease are so vast that it needs multifactorial complex solutions. And we have the technology to today to even learn a better understanding of, of how it works, but still there will remain, as you said, there will remain a few riddles which don't matter if the outcome is, is what you want to see. Exactly. Exactly. So we, we really need 
a new clinical evaluation system for complex um, uh, holistic uh, interventions. Yeah. Alzheimer's disease, you know, there's, Dr. Bredesen found there's like 34 factors that need to be changed, which is why drug, uh, drug research in Alzheimer's has been so unsuccessful because it, there's one. Yeah. They're trying to do one thing when they need to do many things. And that's been my experience in, in cancer. There's not, a, there's not a magic bullet, but there is often a magic matrix. Yeah. So Dwight, if I understood you correctly, you, 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 you say that um, supplements are not only um, for practitioners to use um, uh, in, in, in handling disease, but also for prevention of these are a, a complement, are a, a help for a, for a um, society, for an environment, which is... Um, it's unprecedented in human, human experience. We've yeah. never dealt with... Uh, an industrialized food supply and an industrialized environment. Right. The toxins created by industry. But uh, still, I'm oh, sorry. The, the, I, I really see food supplements as just a complement to, you know, part of normal diet. Um, I, I certainly, some of them are therapeutic, just like Herb, you know, we call certain plants herbs because they have therapeutic activity, yeah. more healing than other foods that which are sustaining. But herbs have special special chemicals in them. And the plants and the fungi are the they are the master chemists um, on the planet, and they have evolved molecules that have co-evolved with humanity for you know, millions of years, however long we've been here. Yeah. Um, so we, it would be so much better to shift back to the plant bioidentical medicines rather than the analogs, which were created mainly because of patent law. Mm -hmm. It's the way our patent law is written that has relegated natural products to kind of the, the eddy currents on the side and not part of the mainstream because um, because they're not patentable. Yeah. Can I can I change or, or, or shift um, a little bit towards the other factors which play a role in sustaining and restoring <laughs> health you have been um, thinking about and, and, and talking about uh, a few times um, I, I, I have I've heard about um, I've heard you talk about this could you could you explain this uh, idea this um, picture of this approach <clears throat> well I, I as, as you said in the introduction that I've given a lot of thought to what are the sort of foundations of health? And the foundations of health in the modern world are different from the foundations of health 100 years ago, mm -hmm. before we industrialized the food supply, before we had the industrial, well, the industrial revolution has been going on for several hundred years, but dramatically accelerated in the last hundred with really the wholesale um, um, intoxication of, of our environment. We are, you know, we're born with 40 some environmental chemicals that can be found in the, you know, in a newborn baby's blood or in, in the umbilical cord blood. And then we, we um, accumulate many more and sometimes we're aware of exposures and sometimes we're not aware of exposures. And um, is, that's one of the kind of cutting edges in medical science right now is to develop sophisticated ways of studying the, the toxic exposures that, we, that we're carrying 
And fortunately, we had many of the so-called detoxification practices that have been developed over centuries and uh, millennia, going back to Ayurvedic medicine. Um, and there was a recognition that it was useful to help the body mobilize waste. Well, it's much more important now because we have a, a much higher burden and a different burden. Um, it's the, the, you know, we're dealing with molecules that haven't been on this planet before. Um, and that applies both to our pharmaceutical medicine, which can be very useful in the acute setting. You know, if I'm in a terrible car accident and I want to go to the best trauma center um, in the area, we're really good at that. Really good at, at managing acute infections. Really bad at managing the chronic degenerative diseases, diabetes, arthritis, hypertension, cardiovascular disease, cancer, autoimmune disease, and so forth. These, the, the pharmaceutical medicine um, can relieve symptoms, but it never deals with the root cause. And so applying kind of ancient practices to enhance the body's ability to get rid of toxins. Sauna, you know, is something that's been used for hundreds of years. And we now have good data that that sweating in a sauna can can eliminate a lot of um, heavy metals as well as other toxins. I often recommend a, a practice from Ayurveda called oil pulling, especially when people are fasting and they're breaking down body fat and releasing fat soluble toxins to get in a sauna and you know put 15 cc's of a good quality oil and just swish it around in your mouth you've got all this especially when you're hot in a sauna you've got a lot of circulation inside the mouth it's a mini version of what we call peritoneal dialysis when somebody's kidneys fail um, there's two ways we can remove those wastes one is just to fill the belly with uh, a solution that will absorb all of the things that the kidneys aren't eliminating from the blood and then let it out. So that's an analogous to oil pulling. You've got fat soluble toxins traveling in the blood and when they come through the mouth, there's a bunch of fat and um, they can offload uh, into it. This, you know, one, in, one example of, of many. So I think just in general, applying detoxification practices is a good idea in the modern world. And I think it can get a lot more sophisticated if we really apply medical science to measuring, excuse me, measuring um, what's in our body fat, what's in our blood, um, what's in our sweat um, and enhance the ability of our, of our liver, our kidneys, our skin, the organs of detoxification um, to really work well. So that, that addresses a couple of the pillars. What I think, um, do, you have, do you have a list of them there? In, in yes, I do, I do. Okay. Is, Why don't we go through it systematically? Because these were, I was just trying to think of everything that that is fundamental particularly in in this era that we're living in and you know i think it's going to get more challenging before it gets better because we're just you know at this point haven't really got a consensus that there's a problem there's a lot of of you know the industrial interests have a huge amount of power and money and they want to understandably they want to maintain the status quo yeah so we don't yet have a, a scientific consensus that's coming forth and saying okay this is a problem 
we need to address it. We need green chemistry. We need to measure environmental toxins. We need detoxification practices. We need food supplements. You know, I've seen tremendous change from when I started practicing in the late 70s till now. We need to go through that and more again to reach the place where people will actually start working collectively on remedying the you know the situation that we're in i think things just haven't gotten bad enough yet uh, to drive it that's why i say i think it's going to get more challenging um but the people who are aware and who take this these these concepts into uh, their life um, will have more protection. But fundamentally, we have to collectively change our practices. I have, I have a list of- To have a, 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 you know, a healthy uh, environment and healthy children and, you know, a healthy species. Yes. I'm sorry for interrupting you. I, I have the list in front of me. And we have touched, you have touched uh, uh, quite many of them already in your talk. And um, so uh, as, as, as time is also a very, very precious uh, resource, um, I'd like to go backwards in this list because okay. it, it finishes, um, or the version I, I, uh, I heard you speak about, finishes with a, with a, uh, with a very, very, great idea which many people are, are puzzling over and that is you say love is essential for health um, is a pillar of health can you elaborate on this well you know if if a human baby is um, given food and water and has no human contact has no love and caring and contact, they die. So it's that fundamental, you know, and it's probably the strongest um, experience that most people have of, of what we call unconditional love when they hold their child for the first time. Uh, you know, it's very profoundly moving. And if we were able to take that feeling that we have with our with a, um, a new baby or our children whom we love unconditionally, no matter what they do, bad, and it makes us angry, we still love them. And if we were able to generalize this to everyone in the world, all of the things we're talking about would, would fall into place because, you know, it's not loving to knowingly um, send toxic chemicals into the environment or to torture animals, you know, in horrible crowded growing conditions to make money. Um, and it's fundamental to the, um, to the healing process. Um, there, you know, there's many different versions of love and we have, um, caritas is the sort of, the Latin word for the unconditional higher love, cupiditas, the personal um, kind of sexual love. Some, you know, I've read many of the um, enlightened um, writers uh, throughout human history who really talk about love being a fundamental principle of the universe, of an actual force that 
that wants to see creation and innovation and new things that's driven by love. And I think just an awareness of it um, in our families, in doctor-patient interactions, um, you know, it's pretty difficult when you're seeing a patient every seven minutes in, a, uh, in, in the way medical care is organized to really get to a, a loving place. And all of the integrative approaches share one thing. They spend a lot of time with people. You know, a typical first visit in an integrative setting is an hour to two hours. And so there's, there's care and attention. It's a form of love yeah. um, that is a requirement for, for healing to take place. And a requirement, you know, we all need love to be healthy. The love of our, our spouses, our families, our children, our friends, our coworkers, um, it's, you know, it's, it's really essential. Thank you. Uh, you talk about connection, physical, as well as um, electrical um, to our planet. Yeah, you know, so many people are so insulated from the planet. We're walking around on cement in cities, wearing shoes with, you know, some kind of usually synthetic soul. Um, we're very electrically insulated from the planet. When I first started practicing in the 70s, I um, got interested in the work of a, a monk, I believe he was in Switzerland, called Father Kneipp. Um, and he dealt with a lot of water water cures and so forth. And he always advised his, his patients to walk barefoot in the grass in the morning dew. And I started recommending that to my patients in, in the late 70s. And um, they were, you know, quite enthusiastic ab about it. Um, later on, I started to, you know, think about that we are electromagnetic beings. We have an electromagnetic field. The earth has an electromagnetic field. We evolved within that field. And we need to reconnect to it. So if we live in the city, it's really good to go out into the country and walk. Um, and you know, I, I have some, some um, flip-flops that are conductive to the, um, to the electrical field of the earth. And I live in a, you know, um, in a rural place, so I, I often go out and, and uh, I have that little protection from the, the sharp <laughs> little seeds that plants make um, that can hurt on bare feet. Um, there's a lot of interest in forest bathing. People talk about going out into the forest. And there's very likely an electromagnetic component of that. There's also the, tr the, the plants, the, the trees, um, elaborate um, little fragrant chemicals called terpenes. Those, all the essential oils that are used in aromatherapy, these are all terpenes. Um, and the, the pinene, which is elaborated by, by pine trees, if you walk in a pine forest, you're inhaling and absorbing pinene, which elevates mood, um, as does limonene, another, another terpene. Um, so regular connection to live to, to nature immersing ourselves in nature 
and when when possible, connecting electromagnetically uh, with the Earth. We, you know, the science of this again is embryonic, um, but I think it makes it makes a lot of intuitive sense. Right. Also, we have in the last hundred years increased the electromagnetic fields that we are living in, especially in cities, um, it's estimated about 50 million fold. So wow. beginning with the transmission of electric electricity in the high voltage grid, and now with Wi-Fi and radio frequency and all the invisible um, electromagnetic frequencies that are coursing through the air that we're all exposed to, nobody knows you know, this is a, a huge experiment that we're all participating in, um, and we, <laughs> we have no idea who's running the experiment uh, or if they're paying attention. Yeah. So, you know, I think it's, it's also useful, um, at least when we sleep, um, because our circadian rhythms are very much influenced by uh, proteins that are induced by electromagnetic fields um, to, um, you know, unplug the Wi-Fi, flip the flip the breaker switch to your bedroom so that there's not electricity running in in the walls and so forth because that creates a field. Um, to just take a break at least when we sleep, so that our body has a chance of, of re-storing um, itself electromagnetically without so much interference. Now, we may be adapting to it. We probably are. But it's a, you know, it's a huge change. It's a sudden change. And it is something which, when you're laden with a um, health problem, uh, which poses um, a risk factor of yeah. And, and there are some people, you know, I, I think they're, well, you know, the English expression is the canary in the coal mine. Mm -hmm. They used to carry canaries because if there was a, natu a, a gas leak, the canary would, would pass out first and they knew to get out. There are people who are, are EMF sensitive, um, who have to really just go off the grid and, um, you know, live out in the forest. The list is so long, Dwight, and I've kept you already for more than an hour, and I am really, um, um, really, really grateful for the time you have devoted. Um, to well, let's just, let's just kind of flip through them, and I'll do a, try to be as succinct as possible with each one. Right. Okay, so then uh, you've touched now on, on biorhythm, um, and then and the next one from, from the bottom or um, in, this, in this order would be um, emotional patterns and mental attitude. Yeah. So it's, it's really become clear to me over, uh, you know, one of the things that I studied because it has major health impact was psychotherapy. I've done many different kinds of psychotherapy myself, um, starting in my twenties. And, um, Learning to learning that we can both fully feel and express our emotions, and that we can powerfully impact our emotions by what we choose to focus on with our mind. The mind and, and the, the mental and the emotional. Um, functions are very closely and deeply intertwined. And um, people who focus on all their problems tend to, to, to generate negative emotional uh, responses. And those negative emotional responses, um, you know, fear and anger, um, trigger stress hormones. And stress hormones raise blood pressure, they, they prepare us for fight or flight. So we're hardwired for that. To, our ancestors needed it to survive. 
we pretty much don't um, in, in the modern age, yet we activate it all the time when we're driving, somebody cuts us off, we get an adrenaline response. Um, so, you know, learning to chill, as uh, they say, is a, is a really important skill. And the classical things of meditation, um, walks in the woods, um, stress management practices, but also keeping your mental focus on where you, where you want to be going, what you want to achieve, uh, or even just being open to your highest potential. Sometimes we don't know what it is that we want. Our, our mind may be too small. Um, and there's something greater in our unconscious and our collective unconscious that's guiding us just to open to that and, um, and let it be. I think that's really crucial to um, creating a, uh, the biochemistry that's necessary for health. Right. Um, environmental um, factors, so physical, chemical, electromagnetic. Um, yeah, well, we've talked about that quite a bit. Yeah. yeah, we did. Social connection. Social connection is incredibly. I, I was astonished when I read a study that social isolation and loneliness have a, a bigger negative impact on health, increase the risk of death from all causes more than obesity, smoking, and um, sedentary okay. lifestyle. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so it's not something that we often think about, but having even it may be a few really deep connections or many um, connections that are, you know, when there's many, they, there's not time for them to be as deep. Um, but I think a few deep ones can equal many less deep ones. And it depends kind of on your personality and your life situation, um, how it evolves. I think the jury is out still on what the social connections are, the effect of social connections that we have through the internet with, you know, social media and, um, and so forth. Um, my intuitive sense is that they're better than nothing, but not as good as face-to-face -face human interaction, play together, work together, brainstorm together, cry together, celebrate together. We are a social, we are social animals. Yeah. And we require um, those connections. So you'll get more benefit out of exercising with a couple of friends than you will by yourself. Um, the, to, I want to provide you with, with a, a bit of um, reading stuff um, on this matter of social connection via the internet. Uh, Dr. Robert Lustig, uh, who's also been on, on this program, has written a book called The Hacking of the American Mind, mm -hmm. which deals with um, nutrition mainly, but um, um, he comes from the psychological and neurological um, approach uh, of nutrition, namely sugar, dopamine uh, circuits in the brain. And he, he's been saying that uh, social media, the way it is uh, designed today, is triggering those dopamine-driven um, um, uh, responses, which, of course, uh, can lead uh, to addiction and, and uh, all sorts of problems. So, yeah, dopamine is highly reinforcing. Yeah. yeah. Um, sleep as a pillar. Yeah, I mean, sleep is, sleep is 
so fundamental to health, we understand really so little about it. We know that it's resting and restoring. We know that dreaming is an important part of it, long-term potentiation, and memory formation. Um, most people don't get enough. Um, most people wake up to an alarm clock, which is kind of, you know, start your day with an adrenaline rush of, um, although alarm clocks are getting a little more friendly and musical than that. So uh, it's not necessary to have the bzzz, um wake you up. But we were really designed, we evolved to go to sleep when the sun goes down and wake up when the sun comes up. Um, we've moved away from that a great deal. We know that screens such as you and I are looking at right now emit blue light. Mm -hmm. We're doing that in the evening, watching a movie or something um, or a webinar. Um, that those blue frequencies turn off our melatonin secretion. So, and without melatonin, it's, it's one of the major cues to the circadian rhythm of sleep. Um, and again, I mentioned that there are specific proteins that are induced by weak electromagnetic fields that are key to our circadian rhythms, which is the wake sleep cycle. Mm -hmm. And another reason why I think it's a good idea to minimize the EMF that you're sleeping with. Because so that there's less interference with um, with all of those functions. I know people who do everything right, except sleep, because they're, you know, they get four or five hours of sleep, you know, six is <laughs> uh, when they're really uh, luxuriating. And that the, we, we, we tolerate that when we're young because we have a lot of resiliency. But I look at that as spending principle instead of living on your interest. And we um, drive ourselves with sleep deprivation. We're, you know, we're spending our, our, our inherited chi. Um, and so you've got to pay that back at some point. Um, I'm not, sh not sure if it can be paid back. I think probably so. I mean, I went through working 120 hour weeks uh, for years in my um, postgraduate training, a lot of sleep deprivation, and um, sleep is, is now such a priority for me, you know, I, and, and I have the, the luxury of a, of a lifestyle in which I can um, sleep as, as much as I need. I mean, there probably are people that do well on six or seven hours of sleep. Um, and when people get very old, they seem to need less sleep. Um, although it's not clear whether they need less sleep or they are unable to sleep. Mm -hmm. Things not working as well. Yeah. So we've touched on supplements, um, which is another um, point on, on the list. Stress and um, ability to manage stress. Yes, yeah, so stress management is is really uh, key. In the, the book that I co-authored after Cancer Care, um, we have quite a bit of discussion about stress management. Yeah, there's the book. Available in English and German. They, there's a very simple stress management practice called... Um, progressive muscle relaxation. It's often taught as part of a yoga, uh, Hatha yoga um, class at the very end where you 
um, go through and systematically tense um, muscle groups in the body and then relax them, um, starting in the feet and going up through the whole body. And this was studied at Ohio State University in women with um, who had been treated for breast cancer and had a significant risk of recurrence because it had positive nodes or other aspects of the cancer that, that made them um, high risk. And the group that practiced um, progressive muscle relaxation, I believe it was five years, had a dramatically lower, not only lower breast cancer recurrence rate, but a 50, 50 some percent reduced risk of dying of any cause, heart attacks, strokes, um, and, and other things, which is a bigger effect, just in terms of the breast cancer, a bigger effect than adjuvant chemotherapy and, and hormonal treatment. So this, you know, stress is sort of so much a part of the water that we swim in that we often don't recognize it. And um, there's good stress and there's bad stress. Um, stress can make us stronger um, in the acute setting, but chronic stress will cause us to um, function less and less well. And it's really particularly crucial to the cancer patient. Stress activates our sympathetic nervous system, the fight or flight or freeze. And the immune system, digestion, so getting all our nutrients, getting our immune system to function, that's all in the parasympathetic nervous system. That's why stress management is so crucial to a cancer patient because if they're stuck, I mean, just getting a cancer diagnosis puts you into sympathetic fight or flight, like, oh my God. Um, and that's one of the things that I start talking with patients, you know, very early on that, you know, there's, there are a few things in life more stressful than getting a cancer diagnosis, especially one that's significantly life-threatening. And you're going to be on this roller coaster and it's going to take you time for you to develop stress management practices. Some people have them already and that's great. And then they can just rely on that more. Um, I often prescribe a beta blocker, the, the, the very earliest beta blocker called Indrol, which blocks the effect of um, stress hormones on the sympathetic nervous system for those first few months um, after a cancer diagnosis. Because it's been found, and a clinical trial has not be yet been done, but it's been found that patients who were taking non-selective beta blockers for other reasons, high blood pressure or atrial fibrillation or whatever, had dramatically better outcomes with the same kind of cancer from people who, who weren't on mm -hmm. a blocker. Uh, there's a pharma, that's kind of a pharmacologic approach to stress management, and that can be a good bridge, but we really need to develop as part of our lifestyle, our stress management practices. And just being aware that you're stressed and controlling your breathing will move you back into parasympathetic. It does, there's all sorts of different formulas of how long to hold your, you know, breathe in and hold the breath and breathe out. But just the simple act of controlling your breath consciously down regulates the sympathetic nervous system, up really regulates the parasympathetic. Right. So, and then there is remaining on the list is uh, nutrition being the first, uh, which we've talked about extensively and uh, exercise. Yeah, well, you know, exercise is something that used to be built into life and now we have to build it into our lives. Um, you used to have to exercise just to, you know, carry water, farm food, collect, you know, take care of animals. Every day there was physical activity just to stay alive, but in the last, with industrialization, we now have, for the first time, the option of being completely sedentary. Mm -hmm. From your, 
you know, your couch to your car, to your office where you sit, to your car, to your house where you watch TV. Um, and, you know, never, never break a sweat. Um, we know that sedentary lifestyle is a major risk factor for obesity, type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease. Um, also, um, cancer, there's a relationship of, um, between cancer risk and exercise. So in our current setting, most people um, have to make time for exercise. They have to build exercise into their lifestyle, just like stress management. But life is inherently stressful. And... Um, for some people more than others and at certain times more than others. Um, but it's not the amount of stress we are experiencing, it's how we respond to that stress. And exercise is a twofer because exercise is also a major stress management tool. Mm -hmm. Exercise uses, when, when you get stressed by something, um, somebody makes you angry, somebody cuts you off in traffic, and you get an adrenaline response, that starts a whole cascade designed for maximal physical activity. So when you do exercise, you get to burn up all that stuff that otherwise is just kind of sitting there and kind of toxic to you. So using that... Um, um, the, 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 the fuel created by stress reduces the stress, improves everything, blood circulation. Um, so, I mean, exercise is, is really fundamental. And I think exercise that involves play is, you know, even better. And exercise that involves social interaction, um, you know, is, is even better. But some form of exercise is essential. Wow. Thank you very much, Dr. Dwight McKee. This has been um, a very, very fascinating talk. Let me finish by again referring to this book, After Cancer Care. It is available uh, both in English and in a German translation. And, and Chinese, by the way. And Chinese. <laughs> wow. Congratulations. I didn't know about that. It covers um, many of the aspects we have uh, discussed um, uh, in, in the last um, half hour. It doesn't make reference particularly to the 12 um, uh, factors or pillars of, of health, but um, um, they're all part of um, this uh, regime, this um, advice which you and colleagues have been um, putting together. And what I find particularly um, useful and, and rewarding is, of course, the chapter on nutrition with many, many hundreds of references to the scientific literature. So everyone, not just uh, people with uh, cancer uh, or in, uh, with, uh, with cancer in their family, um, will find it very useful to read about the, uh, uh, the supplement, uh, science of supplements in this book. I, I really strongly recommend uh, After Cancer Care to all my readers. Thank you very much. One, one very um, interesting thing that was recently discovered in a very large clinical study in France was that the, by report of how often people ate organic food, the more organic food that they reported eating, the lower their risk of cancer was overall, and very dramatically uh, specifically risk of lymphoma. Wow. Um, so, and that's, you know, that's new news. Mm -hmm. Thanks for providing us with this news. And again, thank you for, for the time you have devoted on, um, on us on answering the questions and uh, the answers you have, you have given. This has been uh, great. Thank you very much. Dr. Thank Biden. you. All the best thank to you. you. <laughs>